Good morning, uh, and thank you for coming to the launch of this, as Bronwyn said, the sixth report that we've published as part of a year-long investigation into infrastructure policy making. The report pulls together and synthesises the findings from across this work to make final recommendations on how government can make the right decisions about critical infrastructure sectors such as transport, energy, flood defences, water and waste. I'm going to focus on three key issues today, though of course there's substantially more detail in the report, a, a summary of which you have in front of you. Um, so first, the importance of taking a long-term approach to infrastructure policy making. Uh, second, making the right finance choices and getting a good deal. And third, engaging the public. So starting with taking a long-term approach to infrastructure policy making. Infrastructure decisions by successive governments have been inconsistent and subject to constant change. This is to an extent an uh, inevitable consequence of our democratic system and it would not be possible nor desirable to take the politics out of infrastructure. Yet to be effective, infrastructure policy must be long term and provide certainty for industry, investors and the public. And squaring this circle is a, a key challenge. The starting point must be a widely agreed evidence base on what the country's infrastructure needs actually are. And the National Infrastructure Commission was established to do just that and has made a very positive start. But its success is far from assured. Its longevity and its impact will depend on its credibility across party lines uh, and that, that requires work. Most importantly, its independence must be assured. While it has acted independently to date, this has been largely due to its leadership rather than its organisational form as an executive agency of the Treasury. Like other independent bodies that provide advice such as the OBR or the Committee on Climate Change, we think it should be established as a non-departmental public body so it's got greater independence. Equally, given the sensitivity of infrastructure investment decisions, it must be seen to represent a range of views while the current commissioners are all uh, respected experts in their fields, uh, they're all also somewhat London-centric and are quite heavily weighted uh, towards economists. Um, there are currently a, a number of spare commissioner slots uh, and the Chancellor should prioritise injecting a, a bit of diversity when making further appointments. The first proper test of the NIC's effectiveness will be the response to the publication of the first National Infrastructure Assessment, which is due this summer, particularly the response from the government. The government, we think, should use the National Infrastructure Assessment as the basis for a cross-cutting national infrastructure strategy, and that this should be a key tool for coordinating infrastructure policy and projects across Whitehall and different levels of government. Within central government alone, as this chart shows, there are eight departments and 26 ministers with official responsibility for infrastructure policy. Uh, below this, there are combined authorities, local authorities, LEPs, and from April, subnational transport bodies, all of which have infrastructure roles. This requires coordination that is currently lacking. Even where there are supposed national strategies, these tend to actually be long shopping lists of policies, but provide little sense of how they're meant to fit together. There needs to be a clear framework for prioritising projects and coordinating the work of the numerous arms of government. This is particularly important for large national projects such as HS2, where realising all the potential benefits depends on a wide number of central and local government bodies working together. So the National Infrastructure Strategy, we think, should do three things in particular. One, it must clearly explain how accepted recommendations from the National Infrastructure Assessment interact with existing plans such as the industrial strategy and national policy statements to achieve government's infrastructure objectives. Two, it should set out how the capacity of subnational bodies such as combined authorities and subnational transport bodies will be developed and the formal arrangements by which central government uh, will work with them. And that could be modelled, for example, on the arrangements that have been set out for working with Transport for the North. And three, it needs to be explicit about the extent to which different parts of the country will benefit from investment decisions. Uh, the question of investment decisions brings me on to the second overall point that I'd like to make. The importance of getting a good deal on finance, i.e. the money that's used to meet the upfront costs of infrastructure. 
The UK needs greater investment in infrastructure, but at the moment, as Bronwyn said, it often ends up costing us more than it should. There are various reasons for this, but two finance-related ones are critical. The bias towards private finance and ineffective negotiation and management of private finance contracts. Both of these are particularly relevant in light of Carillion's collapse, which seemingly was partly due to losses on private finance deals. So let's start with the bias towards private finance. The government system of accounting, appraisal and budgeting we have found has created perverse incentives to use private finance, even where it doesn't represent long-term value for money. And as a result, we have more off-balance sheet public-private partnerships than any other leading EU country. And I'd like to highlight four recommendations that we've made for overcoming this. First, government must be much more transparent. Publishing comparisons between different finance options for individual projects and the impact of private finance projects using wider measures of public sector debt which show PFI and PF2 liabilities. Second, government must get much better at collecting, collating and analysing data on private finance deals. One of the big problems with this debate is we have so little evidence about the whole life costs of private versus publicly financed projects. Third, Treasury budgeting processes should leave fiscal headroom for projects which emerge outside of the spending review cycle to prevent departments defaulting to private finance. And fourth, although there has been significant progress um, in improving the government's commercial skills, there's more work to be done. In particular, there remains a lack of awareness of the commercial and finance specialisms among departmental leadership teams. Even where private finance could provide better value for money, the government is not doing enough to realise these benefits, and it's certainly not doing enough to meet its stated objective of increasing the volume of private investment in UK infrastructure. Most pressingly, the absence of a clear pipeline of projects creates investor uncertainty, reduces the number of potential investors, reducing competition for contracts, eroding investor confidence in government, and leading ultimately to higher costs for taxpayers and consumers. A new PF2 pipeline was promised by the Chancellor in the 2016 autumn statement, but is yet to arrive. If government's serious about getting more private investment at a good price, then this must be published ASAP. The third overall point I'd like to make is about engaging the public. Too often in the UK, the government's approach has been to streamline consultation processes. But if communities do not feel they've had a genuine say on projects, then they often oppose them entirely, resulting in delays which can cost millions of pounds. Yet the evidence from the UK and abroad shows that taking a more structured approach to conflict resolution can be beneficial for government and communities alike. In our report, we cite the example of France's National Commission for Public Debate, which, despite having no formal powers to enforce its recommendations, has provided a route through which communities can have their say and make a meaningful difference to major <coughs> infrastructure projects. So as shown on here, the two green bars are where significant changes have been made to projects in France as a result of the CNDB consultation process. So we propose uh, creating a similar independent body here, uh, a commission for public engagement that we think should do three things. One, facilitate in-depth deliberations with representative, randomly selected panels of citizens which would discuss policy options for inclusion in the government's national infrastructure strategy. Two, uh, when national policy statements are developed or updated, uh, this body could facilitate public debates with local communities that are likely to be affected by the resulting major infrastructure projects. And three, it could provide advice to project sponsors during the pre-application consultation stage of the nationally significant infrastructure project planning regime. Such a body could be established cheaply and without disruption to the existing major project planning process, giving communities a real say, providing greater certainty to government and other scheme promoters, and reducing delays that can run to hundreds of millions of pounds. None of this is to say that these decisions are easy. Investment in infrastructure raises fundamental political questions and the projects themselves can be hugely complex. But while government has made improvements, there's much more that could be done. 
Today's report and the previous five, which look in detail at issues such as the use of cost-benefit analysis, public versus private finance, and the politics of infrastructure decision-making, provide some practical recommendations on further recommendations that could be made. Thank you.